Hello, welcome or welcome back to Ensuring Success. I'm Gail Perry, Editor-in-Chief of CPA Practice Advisor Magazine, and we are here in lovely Dallas where it's getting warmer every day, and we're loving that, um, where we're broadcasting live. Um, we have 14 hours of continuing education for you across two days, today and tomorrow. We're so glad that you're here with us. Um, I want to uh, first mention that we want to thank our sponsors who make this event possible. And our sponsors this year are ADP, Ace Cloud Hosting, CPA Charge, Avalara, Botkeeper, ComplyRight, CorePay, CoreV, CPA.com, eFile for Biz, Intuit, uh, QX Global Group, Right Networks, Safe Send Returns, Sage, SureLink, TaxFile, Vic AI, Walters, Kluwer, and Zero. And in particular, we want to thank uh, Right Networks, who is sponsoring this particular session and making it possible for all of us to get CPE credit and uh, and learn an incredible amount of information while we're here. Um, I also want to mention that if you are planning on collecting CPE credit for this session, for any sessions uh, during today and tomorrow, the way we issue credit is, the way we verify your attendance, is we will post three sets of random numbers on the bottom of your screen. I'll call your attention to them. You need to write down those numbers. Each number is a three-digit number. So at the end of any session, you will have nine digits associated with that session. And then uh, when you're, whenever you're finished with this conference, whether it's today or tomorrow or at some point in the future, go back to the Ensuring Success home screen. And on that page, there's an option to click a link at the top of the page that says, Get My CPE. And you click there and record the numbers that you collected in all the sessions you attended. And then you can download your certificates. So that's how CPE works. Um, I want to mention that also we will be sending out what we're calling a digital tote bag. So look in your email within the next week. All of our sponsors have prevent, have presented information and uh, things you need to know about their products, some special deals. So look for that. That'll be coming from CPA Practice Advisor relating to this event. And um, also, one other thing, at the bottom of the screen, there's an option where if you scroll below the video window, there's an option where you can ask a question. So if you have any questions about how this is working, or if you have any questions for our speakers, you can use that box to, uh, to contact us directly. And before I turn this over to our speakers, uh, Alexandra has an announcement. Alexandra yes, is my co-moderator. Yes, I, I have some breaking news, which is that our polling software is now working again. In order to see the poll, you will need to refresh your browser. This shouldn't do anything. Just hit the refresh on the top, and then you will see uh, a the, your, it will say chat disabled on the very bottom, where it says that it asks you to enter your name, simply your name, and then you should see a poll that's currently there. Once you hit refresh, the poll just says test poll question, answer one, two, three, or four. If you guys can just take a second to do that, because we will have some polls at this session, and we'd love for you to see how the audience is reacting to certain issues. So again, just hit the refresh, put your name, and then you'll see the poll. And you, after that, you should not have to answer, you should not have to enter your name again. The polls will just appear as we announce them. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Okay, Alexandra is my co-moderator here, and uh, why don't you introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll have our speakers introduce themselves. Absolutely. So I'm Alexandra DeFelice. I'm Director of Marketing and Business Development for Pain and Fears. It's a law firm in Southern California, and yes, that is the real name. Uh, I, in my former life, I was also a journalist writing for several accounting magazines, which is how I've known Gail and come to help out with this almost every year. Yep. Thank you. All right, and so this session is called Data Security, It's the Law. So we may have some, uh, some startling information for you about things that you need to know about regarding security in your own business and with your clients. And I'd like to just go down the line here and have our panelists introduce themselves. So let's start with Roman. Good morning. I'm Roman Kepchak, Director of Firm Technology Strategy for Right Networks. I am a uh, basically old CPA partner in a firm who started consulting uh, about 25 years ago. And pretty much my primary role is working with accounting firms and helping them implement today's digital best practices. All right. And Eric? I'm Eric McMillan, uh, lead consultant and owner of the McMillan Group. We specialize in uh, digital security, primarily dealing with professional service firms, accounting, legal, 
been doing it for about 27 years now and probably a uh, little longer than I wanted to. <laughs> And David. All right, David sees like I'm the Chief Cloud Officer for RKL eSolutions, uh, CPA by background, uh, but really have spent most of my career in tech. Uh, IT security, security certified through SANS. I got my GSEC certification. So living at kind of the intersection of accounting and technology is uh, where I spend my days. All right, so there's a lot to talk about here and I have a lot of questions and I think our audience will as well, but let's just start with what's, what's the most important thing people need to know right now about data security? Well, I'll start with that. that the main thing is take it seriously. Uh, more often than not, people think it's being taken care of by their IT department um, or their outsourced provider, but make sure you go through the checklist with the client, uh, with your, um, your provider to make sure it's done, being done properly and that you're protecting against all the things, not just phishing, but ransomware as well. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm gonna actually just add one thing to that. It, it, I, don't, I don't want people to be paranoid, I want them to be vigilant and constantly aware. So I think that was well stated. Take it seriously, be aware, uh, because so often I think, you know, to your point, we think that's a, the, the function of the back room of our IT staff, and we're, we're, we're not really kind of realizing our personal role in all of this. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I find is when dealing with uh, professional service firms, going back to taking it seriously, is a lot of people seem to think, well, we're just an accounting firm. Why would they pick on us? Well, because, again, this is a professional criminal enterprise now. It's not some teenager sitting in their mother's basement. The reason that they want you is they know that you probably don't have professional IT staff and you have a trove of important information that is highly valuable on the black market. Absolutely, and they're learning to monetize this. You know, even if they break into a company and encrypt all their data files, before they, um, like I said, encrypt it, they've actually stolen that data because there's actually a market out there to resell it to different groups. And we've seen auctions, you know, mm -hmm. literally public auctions of troves of famous people's personal files. But a lot of this is automated too. And so you, yeah. you, when you're searching, you know, to, uh, I think you said, you know, who would pick on little old me? The reality is it's automated tools out there constantly looking for weak and vulnerable systems. Mm -hmm. They're, they discover those and, and go to town. So it's not like they're even you know, spending a bunch of time saying who are the high value targets. It's all automated. And that's what happened with the Microsoft Exchange thing. Basically, mm -hmm. they had a tool that when there was a zero day vulnerability, that tool went out there and they knew all the different servers that were running that on a local. And so that's one of the reasons actually why we recommend you don't run your own exchange. You use an external provider, hosted solution provider that can, a vendor that does that professionally. Yeah. So speaking of that, what, what do we mean by data security? I mean, I mean, we know there are a lot of scary things out there, but when you're looking at your own firm, what do you need to do? To protect? One, of, one of the first things that any firm needs to do is you need to do an information risk assessment. Not all information needs to be protected in the exact same way. So what we tend to find is most firms are spending way too much protecting information that really doesn't have any value, but nowhere near enough on the information that actually has the value. Once we've ascertained that, then what we wanna do is, okay, let's look at the controls we have around that high value information and make sure that we're doing everything to protect that. And within an accounting firm, that would be like their tax files, the tax application. It would be their engagement binders where they store the client's records. It could be their scanning software that actually does the you know, um, OCR to bring the data into the tax return. You also have to make sure that data that's being sent off-site you know, to providers that are doing you know, third-party services are doing the same level of security as well. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, think about it just metaphorically in your office. I mean, we typically lock up the HR files. You know, those are those are under lock and key. Same idea. We're going to take a look at you know uh, the population of data and the applications and say what are the the proper levels of security. Uh, you know, given the actual information, we've got clients. You know, f information files uh, that we want to make sure that we're properly, reasonably protecting, and you know our reputations at risk there too if any of that gets compromised. But I think the reality is, that for many organizations, we really need to start pulling in into the conversation. 
what's our best approach going to be? Uh, so, you know, what is the role of cloud-based providers and yeah. cloud-based uh, services? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, in years past, there was a reluctance. Uh, I think with COVID, uh, we were all forced uh, instantly overnight uh, to really fully embrace remote and mobile and cloud. Uh, but really understanding that now too, and both the risks, uh, but more importantly, really, I think the benefits of that approach, because too often, you know, the compromises that we're seeing are in a lot of the legacy shops. So you talk about current risks, you think about ransomware, you think about, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, just overall compromises uh, and attacks on networks. Too often it's coming for, from those, you know, those smaller, unprotected, unpatched, you know, organizations that don't have full-time IT security resources and it's time to rethink that and really say you know what they, they, we have reasonable approaches to this this is where the cloud enters the picture and we really need to say am I doing everything I can as I inventory applications and data where should that be who should be in charge of that and is that in fact the better approach and I would argue that it absolutely is and one of the other things as you move to the cloud you need to ensure that the controls and everything that's in place at the cloud actually integrates with uh, your firm. Too often we see firms that hand off to the cloud and then essentially just abdicate responsibility. No, just because you moved it to the cloud, it is still the responsibility of the firm to take care of that data and ensure that everything's being met, whether it's the you know, agreement with the third party provider or within there, because if there is a breach, your client doesn't care that it was this cloud provider that got breached. You're the one they gave the data to. So Eric, that is making me as the accountant feel really nervous, right? Because now <laughs> I'm like, wait, I, I know I have to be safe, but now it's my responsibility and I don't have a huge tech team. I'm not a top 100 firm. What, what do I have to do? Because this is, this is way too much. This is outside of my comfort zone. Well, as you move to the cloud, and I agree with, um, that that's probably the best way for a lot of people to move in the accounting profession is you basically have to have vendor management. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a checklist making sure, you know, that they have their SOC 2 in place and, you know, that their financials are stable and it's not just, you know, some pop-up company that may or may not exist in three, six months. Uh, so whose responsibility is that within the firm? Who do you see usually uh, takes charge Generally what we do, and I'm bringing this from my background in working with financial institutions, is they always have a vendor manager. So there are you know, good vendor risk assessment worksheets that are out there, vendor management policies, but you assign somebody to be a vendor manager or possibly multiple people. So maybe you have somebody within the tax department that's handling it, you know, for your tax processing software, somebody within audit for uh, your work paper software. Okay, so vendor management policies and questions is what people would look up to kind of get this running list of questions about Cor SOX compliance. Correct, and yeah. Okay. And, and a lot of that they can find, especially from uh, some of the banking websites, there's a lot of good information out there for that. Great, thank you. We need to take just a moment to post our first CPE code on the screen, so be sure to record this number if you're planning on collecting CPE for this session. Mm -hmm. This is the first of three numbers that you'll get for this session, so make a note of it. And, uh, and while you're doing that, let me ask again, uh, you are talking about vendor manager. Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, vendor manager is going to be the go-between between the cloud vendor or technically any other vendor and the firm. So they're gonna be the one responsible for pulling together that information and if there's an issue, either taking it up with the vendor or moving it to management of the firm. So kind of a vendor onboarding process you know, all the way through to an ongoing, you know, reevaluation or con just over time, making sure you're reassessing, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and understanding if there's been any compromises, any weaknesses with yeah. that vendor. So it's onboarding initially, risk assessment, and then from there, making sure that you're managing that relationship. Yeah. So generally, you're going to have service level agreements or SLAs with a vendor saying, you know, 
amount of downtime that's acceptable or any of that. And that's something that the vendor manager will also monitor in that ongoing manner. So this seems like a little bit of a double-edged sword to me because, I mean, I remember when the, the conversation first started that we should all be paperless, and then we learned about the term the cloud, and, every, and then COVID hit, and everybody was like, thank goodness we were using the cloud. But if we weren't using the cloud, it's, we wouldn't be having this discussion about how to protect the data that's in the cloud. So um, is this encouraging firms to go back to file cabinets and papers? No, that's actually even less secure. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of firms, especially smaller firms, always uh, equate security to proximity. And that's not necessarily true. I've walked into a lot of firms and here's the central file server just kind of sitting here unsecured. Uh, so any, you know, copier repairman or something could just walk in, plug something in. Uh, and again, going back to having professional IT staff uh, within the firm. Most firms can't afford to do that, so they're relying on their operational IT folks who have a big enough job just trying to keep everything running, let alone trying to keep up with all the current attacks. Whereas as we move to outsource security providers, uh, various cloud vendors, we're taking advantage of that economy of scale and the expertise that they can afford to hire because that's their sole job. Yeah, the cloud providers tend to have enterprise class security, security teams in place in there, and they're 724 doing the work, and they have outside parties reviewing their stuff. When I go in and I do like technology reviews of firms, I find that the IT person does a good job on the things that they have to do as far as the network backups and that kind of stuff and updates, but when it comes down to the other things that requires the other, all the employees to be involved with the password, you know, credentials kind of stuff, the backups that, that happening, they're just not doing as good a job. The training on the phishing and those kind of things. And the reality is when you ask them how much free time do they have to focus on security, they basically say, I barely have enough time to just get the updates done and handle the questions that are coming at me from the, the professional staff. And so that's why we see by transitioning more and more to the cloud providers, that becomes more of like a utility. It just runs in the background and, you know, because they have so much at risk and so much, you know, so much more staff and access to these enterprise class tools, the small firms that do it themselves can't compete with that. So let's scare our, our viewers a little <laughs> bit more. Um, specifically, what can happen? What's, what's, what's the rabbit hole we can get into? What kind of bad things can happen to us if we're not using top level data security? Well, the, the obvious thing is, is like if you're not doing your system updates on your servers, um, as David mentioned, they, 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 the criminals have um, enterprise class tools as well with artificial intelligence that are automated that as soon as a zero day vulnerability is identified, that means that Microsoft and the other vendors have not even aware of it, they launch an attack on all the servers they know that are running that application or you know, running that um, hard piece of hardware with the different routers, which is what happened to a lot of the um, remote wireless, you know, the wireless routers that we have in our homes. Virtually anything over a year has been breached that's yeah. out there. And so they launch those tools immediately. And again, if you have an IT person who's doing your work just in-house, they don't have time to do it and keep up. They're not looking every single day at what server patches has Microsoft rolled out. Well, we were we were talking uh, a little bit earlier, just the three of us, and, and thinking through just what you know we've observed as, as some of the you know the most common breaches. It's it's ransomware, and it's you know typically going on these these unpatched systems, or maybe even a zero day vulnerability that's been discovered through some kind of automatic crawl. And the reality is a you know a black hat only has to be right once. I mean you know get lucky yeah. once. I mean we have to be you know vigilant, but you need to understand where the risks. You know, come from. So we talked about you know looking at data. We talked about looking at applications. But really, so oftentimes, you know, we think about how do they actually get in the door? How do they get inside of our organization? It's through these older, unpatched, maybe archival, you know, systems. We've got that stood up in the corner. That we we look at that once or twice a year to look up some old data, and it's running a version of Windows Seven. It's like, oh my, oh my goodness. And if that's connected to the internet, and it's you know very you know that can be discovered, it becomes that becomes the 
the vector, the point of attack. So it's really, you think about it, you know, it's just, it's one hole in the boat is all it takes to, to usually sink the thing. So you want to understand not just, you know, where the high value stuff is and all the good measures we're taking around all the high value, but really understand, you know, what, you know, all those connected systems are and what risk do those bring into the solution because, uh, you know, into, into your environment. Because as I said, it's all automated and all it takes is just one compromise and the ransomware is off to the races from there typically. And just to put an exclamation point on his Windows 7, no one should allow any connections to the company with Windows 7 computers. They've all been breached, they've all been compromised. And so even like if you have a kid at home whose computer breaks and you have him one on the shelf, don't connect it because that's your first, you know, yeah. they've been breached. And one of the biggest things uh, to David's point is uh, most of the firms that I go in to do vulnerability or security assessments for do not even understand or have an idea, and this is their IT department, what is actually connected to their network. It is very common to find where employees have brought in little things and plugged it into the network. <laughs> uh, Wireless printers and that's yeah. the compromise, we see that. For, you know, they do it for convenience as opposed to having policy, but again, you can't patch what you don't know is well, there. We have a saying, you know, you got to think about security first, convenience second. Yeah. Too often, you know, it's that convenience yeah. is that first, <laughs> that's the slippery slope that gets yeah. you right into a compromise. Mm -hmm. So what kind of things should people be doing? I, mean, I think you mentioned passwords, but, you know, I mean, everybody, like, has easy passwords, right? My birthday, One, two, my mother's maiden name. You mean yeah. isn't, isn't good enough anymore? Yeah. <laughs> I would tell you, you know, we're, we're big fans of saying, look, not only, you know, look to the cloud-based because they've got that 24-7 security contingent, watching over the applications, making certain that the data is secure, backing things up, having a hot site that can fail over if, when, as needed. But really, what are the controls around that environment, making sure that you've got multi-factor authentication, I think is table stakes anymore for virtually any product we're working with. Uh, you shouldn't be connecting to a cloud-based product this is this you know without multi-factor authentication and would you explain that yeah so multi-factor authentication is simply is basically saying you know it goes beyond just login name and password it's potentially saying I need you know an authentication code some kind of you know and and you know maybe an app that runs on your phone uh, maybe a key that you insert into your laptop uh, it could be a facial scan so it's it's you know what you know what you have and who you are those are the three factors of authentication multi-factor just means two of three and so typically, depending on the value of the data, you absolutely want two-factor authentication, multi-factor, three-factor may even come into play depending on the sheer sensitivity and the value of it uh, at some point. So, but multi-factor to me is a connectivity baseline. Yeah. And not only for connecting to third-party clouds, even if you still have systems inside your office, any administrative or ele elevated account should be required to use two-factor authentication to log on. And there's a lot of tools out there that uh, people can get into multi-factor authentication. What we see on the corporate side is they tend to utilize tools like Duo and Okta, mm -hmm. uh, but we see in the smaller firms, you have products out there like Google Authenticator, Microsoft mm -hmm. Authenticator, and the main point there is, is if you're gonna use those type of tools, make sure it's installed by someone who knows how to implement them. Too often times we implement tools or, you know, we download them from the internet and we think we can use a VPN and it's a secure, a password manager that's secure and those kind of things. And we may not be configuring it properly to be able to work to, to, to actually guarantee the security. And what do you mean by VPN? Uh, VPN is a virtual private network. And um, we had a discussion of this that like when, you, when we connected here at the studio, is like I never connect to any public Wi-Fi. And what public Wi-Fi is, could be a client's Wi-Fi, it could be a Starbucks, it could be a Marriott. Mm -hmm. So don't ever connect to those um, without a VPN in place. But again, you have to have that professionally installed so that everything you transfer through your machine, your login and password, is encrypted all the way through and there's no way that, you know, if, if this place was hacked, there's keyboard loggers that would capture that stuff. And so, so another perfect example of a cloud-based service, though, is oftentimes those cloud-based services, multi-factor authentication to make that connection. You're not, in effect, doing a VPN to them, but you're doing you know, what's called HTTPS, a secure protocol through your browser to that cloud-based provider. So that is going to be a secure connection. So do we worry about you know, sitting in a Starbucks or hotel or something, and we're connecting to those you know, secure websites with multi-factor authentication? Good there.
there. And tunneling through a VPN is probably a layer of security that's not necessarily required. So in effect, it's baked in to a lot of the cloud-based products. Okay. Um, we need to take a quick break. We want to hear a little bit from our sponsor, Right Networks. When we come back, we'll show you the second CPE code for this session, and also uh, we'll run a poll to see how you guys are doing with your own data security. So we'll be back in just a moment after this break. And I would like to display the second CPE code for this session on the bottom of your screen. So please be sure to make note of this if you're planning on collecting continuing education credit for this session. And Alexandra has a couple of announcements for us. Okay, so once again, um, there, were, there might have been a technical glitch again. Welcome to today's technology. We love it, we hate it. <laughs> um, but we're back. And um, again, if you did not already do so, if you refresh your browser, you will see that it will say chat disabled at the bottom. Just type in your name and then you will see this poll question. We are interested to know when is the last time that your firm experienced a security breach? These, I'm pretty sure, are anonymous, but um, we won't let anybody know. Uh, six to 12 months, one to two years, two to three years, or more than three years. Um, and the answer might be, you don't know, uh, but we didn't put that as a choice. So uh, again, just let us know. Uh, again, anonymous polling. We won't report this to anyone. We're just very interested to see. We're seeing more of these, even with accounting firms. I now work for a law firm, um, it, and they're getting much more sophisticated, right? In my, uh, you know, what, what do people need to be scared of. It's not, you know, the Egyptian kings or whatever anymore that are coming in. Well, so interestingly enough, Alexander, that's a good point. So, and, and I know, you know, never, by the way, was not one of the options in that poll, so <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that too. To win. But I think the scary, you talk about scaring people. Uh, if, if in fact a system is compromised, some of the behavior we're seeing by the attackers these days is the system is compromised and they do nothing. They just observe. That's literally, they're there quietly, observing what's going on, evaluating, assessing, essentially, you know, looking for, you know, what are those valuable pieces of information? What is, it, you know, I'm, I'm in. Who are these people? What do they do? What's valuable to them? Do I have an opportunity to kind of, you know, do uh, some kind of ransomware kind of, of approach here? And so it's them silently living on your system. You talk about being, you know, petrified. Yeah. That's, the, that's the behavior, I think, you know, that we're most uh, probably uh, leery of. One of the funny things, though, is once they do get in, they don't want to share with anybody. So they'll actually patch your systems for you. <laughs> and, and yes, and just keep access for themselves. And we are actually starting to see criminal organizations now that are becoming specialized. So they're even, we have one group, they do nothing but build the tools and making a very good living then selling those automated tools to other groups. Those groups specialize in breach. So all they're doing is getting in the door and then looking at the information and then auctioning off all these that access to ransomware groups. To other yeah. bad guys. <laughs> and yeah. what's interesting, yeah. they actually have call centers now. If you look yeah. at the top, Conti, <laughs> Reval, Maze, uh, you know, those different groups, they actually outsource the support for the uh, getting the Bitcoin to make the payments to someone else. They actually have call centers that if they, you try to restore your backups, they know that there's a, a prompter that says, we know you're restoring your backups. It's not going to work because we've hidden in a bunch of your files and there's no way you can detect that. So... 
All it's right. when like a pr professional corporation, and as soon as they learn a, a new avenue of attack or a new way to monetize that data, they basically, they have their version of CPE and they so teach amongst the themselves. Session this yeah. <laughs> That's the reality of the yeah. thing. So uh, we have the results. I don't know if people are telling the truth, but more than 80% said that it's been more than three years. 3% to 2 to 3, 5% 1 to 2 years, and 9% said 6 to 12 months. That's still when we have several thousand people attending is not a, a small number. So my question here is, what do you do to educate your staff? Um, I actually had, at, when I worked for a larger firm, we had the IT people sent their own malicious emails to us mm -hmm. to see who would click on things. And it was kind of, again, terrifying is the word of this, of this session. Yeah. Well, there's actually um, phishing services out there. Uh, companies like Proofpoint, CoFence, um, probably the most popular is No Before. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they work with the IT team in the company or the cloud provider to actually send out specific types of phishing emails that are spear phishing, you know, where it actually has your name in it. It has a link. It might have information that's important for in your internal operations, such as here's the budget for next year. Um, we noticed your payroll had a, a status change. Did you authorize this? So it's things that are unexpected. Um, they are, require you to have some urgency to it to respond to it. But they actually send those out, and then they give you a report that if you do click on one of those, they tell you what you did wrong. They also report right. it to corporate, but then they also make you do training so you don't yeah. uh, repeat that behavior. So can you just um, repeat those uh, the, the couple of vendors that you mentioned just now for people? Yeah, uh, probably, like I said, no before is the no best before, known. Like but just K-N-O-W. K-N-O-W, yeah. B-E, and then the number four. Okay. There's CoFence and Proofpoint, Co which was the old Wombat, and I'm trying to think yeah. the other provider that we uh, see in the Fishing survey. Fishing Box is another one. And Fish Me was yeah. the other group that was there. Okay. Right, yeah, so do they, they report the results to the individual and say you did a bad thing, or do they give it to the Both. head of IT? Or, okay. Yeah. Both, so you know, and if, if you start Both. to see a trend of certain types of phishing emails coming to your company, they'll identify those things and let you know about it. So th This rolls all the way back to where we started the whole conversation, which is the personal role, each and every single person. I always used to say that the weakest person in your security strategy is anyone with a mouse. I mean, because if you think about it, that, you know, where does compromise happen? It's when we're connected to the outside world. You're clicking on things, you're navigating to things, and so, you know, we talk about, you know, doing the, this email test to see who's potentially not thinking maybe all the way through. I know within our organization, a lot of our client organizations, you pretty much should be, set the expectation, we're constantly going to be doing a check down with you to, to confirm that you're not clicking on things you shouldn't be clicking on, and so fully expect that you're gonna see email in your inbox that's going to try to entice you to click on it. And if you even adopt that kind of mindset, it changes the way you even think and about your own inbound email inboxes. This, everything could be a compromise. Precisely. Now you're thinking like I want you to think because everything could be a compromise. And one of the biggest things, whether you're using a service, doing it in the house, is you can't run the phishing test as just a gotcha moment. You need to have that training embedded at the point of failure because that's what keeps things front of mind for those end users. If uh, you're just doing it as a gotcha, uh, you're going to wind up having a whole lot of unhappy end users and you're not getting any value from what you're doing. Now we had 80% or so of our poll people say that it's been two to three years since they've had a security breach or maybe they wanted to say never and it wasn't an option. Um, and I think your position here on this panel is that they probably have had a breach and didn't know it. So what are the signs? How do you know if you've been breached? Well, I think, you know, when you talk about breaches, you know, clicking on a phishing email is considered a breach. Um, I watch the security logs and every day, we, you know, every day we have uh, clients, you know, we have about 11,000 clients in our cloud premier group and 210,000 on the, the formal side. And we, someone clicks on it and they contact us right away and we have a team that jumps on it and basically clears it out. But, and we track those to see what are the repeatable things that, to push out to make sure it doesn't happen and we do the but education again, right there. this kind of goes back to... Uh, you know, using cloud providers and our in-house IT staff because you have to be monitoring, you know, whether it's a type of breach where they're exfiltrating data. Well, are you watching your firewalls to see unusual streams of data now going to Pakistan? Mm -hmm. And we don't do business in Pakistan. 
but because the in-house guys too busy doing everything else, those logs never get looked at until it's too late. Whereas if you went with a managed service provider, they're watching that 24 seven, but you have to be monitoring the activity on your network. And so, yeah, and, and I, I know we were talking earlier too uh, about just there's products out there like Pwned, uh, <laughs> you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, I think that's P-W-N-E-D, Have right? Have I been Pwned? Have yeah. I been Pwned? Uh, and what that means is has your login name password combination been part of some kind of compromised data dump and it's out there now in the wild? You pretty much need to assume that any password you haven't changed in the last, I'll say six months, uh, has been compromised. I think that's pretty safe at this point. And so, uh, and that, and, and you think about, you know, corporately, a lot of, you know, uh, entities say, well, no, we've got good password, you know, uh, policy in place. We're going to force that password change. But again, I'm going back to personal now, because for many of us, we may be using passwords that we set up and started using three, four, five, you know, however many years ago well, uh, yes. and, and haven't <laughs> changed. Now, I appreciate that there's some browsers, Google Chrome, uh, Internet, uh, um, you know, uh, Edge. Edge, thank you, I was going to say Explore. Uh, <laughs> Edge, you know, are now kind of alerting you within the browser saying, hey, we see that you've got some cached credentials here that were part of a compromise. Mm -hmm. You probably want to go ahead and update those. But I think it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty reasonable to just assume old passwords have all been now uh, laid bare. So, and we actually recommend firms use password wallets you know, individuals, because, you know, one of the things is if a hacker finds out, for instance, your uh, hotel chain login and password, they have tools that actually check all the other hotel chains to see if you repeated it. In the accounting profession, we tend to do that with our tax software. Well, we'll use the same login and password for every tax account that's out there. And so using the password wallets, and there's tools like Keeper, Dashlane, LastPass, Zoho, that, uh, you know, basically you have one master password that's very complex you log into, but it creates a string of 32 characters for every single login. So if one of your tax applications gets breached, the other ones can't be um, used the same password. And for that one really strong password, one of the things you want to do is let's get away from the whole term of password, let's use a passphrase. It's easier for a human to remember and much more complex. So, or multi-factor authentication to open yes. up that password locker. Yes, you know, it's a perfect that works too. So, yeah. What do you mean by a passphrase? So instead of saying password one two three, you do capital M Mary space had a little lamb and stuff. While it's human readable, easy to remember, the way we crack password hashes, it's going to take a lot of cycles. <coughs> We're talking hundreds or thousands of years at current technology. Yep. Mm -hmm. Once we get quantum computing, all it's bets all are over. off. Yep. So when I know Hollywood makes it all so simple, and yeah. looks so simple, you just sit down and you just crack a password. Yeah. The reality is, no, you can make sufficiently difficult passwords, but don't over-rely on passwords. Yeah. You know, I know as we've gone through security certification, that's one of the first things they tell you, is passwords are, they don't, we don't want to eliminate them from the equation, but we don't want to over-rely on them either because mm -hmm. they're, they're a very rudimentary form of protection. Yeah. And so you got to have good policy around that, change it, you know, update it, make them sufficiently complex using past phrases rather than past words. Um, but, you know, again, I'm going to keep pulling multi-factor back mm -hmm. into the mix here because it's far more difficult. And it's always about saying what's the easiest way to break into an organization. Oftentimes it is going to be through those unpatched systems. It's going to be through those weak passwords, but we can shore up some of that with multi-factor and, you know, that becomes now uh, exponentially more difficult to breach. And even uh, going back to education and phishing testing of your employees, <coughs> one of the services we also provide is incident response. Every incident we've responded to in the last four or five years has all started with some form of social engineering. Mm -hmm whether it was a phone call, an email, a text, something along that, to, to get that initial foothold into the network 
and then they just start exploring and pivoting from there. Smishing. I know yeah. We've yeah, social engineering is basically getting trust through one way or another. And so basically like faking someone to give their credentials up or click on a link and things. And so we do, that's what phishing is, mm -hmm. the spear phishing and the business email compromise. Um, they actually have vishing now mm -hmm. where they, deep fakes can actually um, listen to Dave's voice for 10 minutes and then actually a person could replicate and sound exactly like Dave with the software, the artificial intelligence tools are there. You know, we've seen the deep fakes with actually doing videos to that mm -hmm. too. But in the business email compromise, there's been a couple cases where they now have, the hacker groups have consolidated and they now have vishing as a service, just like they have ransomware as a service. And so we just need a video of you on this presentation. And now so sorry. I can call I can your say. company and say, uh, write me a check yeah. and get it out today. Yeah. So. Okay, so I, I wanted to transition into something a, a lot more simple. And I'm going to start with Eric, even though he's the hardest one for me to see because I'm <laughs> short and I can't see over people's heads. But I'm going to start with you, and I know you both will have comments on this. We were talking the other day about improper training for people that are working from home. There's been this intersection between work and personal, and we've talked about that for several years. Years, but now it's just magnified. And so what what are you seeing that, that people are doing, businesses are doing wrong when their people are working from home? And then if Roman and Diva can chime in about good examples and practices that you can be yeah, implementing. Yeah, one of the first things, especially when COVID hit and we pushed everybody out to be remote workers, most firms didn't have training nor equipment to handle that many remote workers. So we saw a lot of people just saying, just use your home computer or, you know, we'll drop in a VPN concentrator very fast. It was not installed professionally, was not configured correctly. So we had people going home and essentially connecting to our corporate networks with the same computer that their son is pirating games on that is already has all the keystroke loggers on there. Mm -hmm. So that just opened that up. The other thing is without the education of the end users, the bad guys took advantage of this for all sorts of phishing. And with the, fe the fear that was out there with COVID, that gave them a lot of good taglines to send those emails and get people clicking on. Yeah, so David, what, what do you recommend people do? So first, easy stuff. Easy, easy stuff. <laughs> first, first of all, it needs to be the business-based you know, assets that uh, our employees are using. So laptops, you know, whatever devices they're using at home, we want to make sure. Because when we send people home, that has the effect of extending the perimeter of the network. It now lives you know, in people's homes. So make sure it's company-issued uh, devices that we're able to monitor, patch, uh, you know, and, and really keep an eye on. Uh, we want to require a VPN if we're connecting to you know any resources in the office we're going to be using secure browser connectivity to cloud-based uh, you know applications uh, and you know even within the home if they're making a Wi-Fi connection uh, do that you know um, maybe even do that uh, you know, we uh, we often talk about saying uh, bifurcate your network at home break it into two pieces where you've got you know maybe some of the IOT devices you know your doorbells and your your garage door openers sitting on a guest network and you know where DMZ, they call it. Uh, so really something... And for that, your teenager, put them on there. Yeah, yeah put, exactly <laughs> right. Keep them out of that trusted <laughs> network. But we, we want to do everything we can to, to kind of secure the, you know, to, to secure the front. And it really means, you know, don't lose control of the devices. Don't have them just use their home machines because that is uh, absolutely asking for trouble. And one of the changes in mindset we've seen actually inside of the firms is in the past, you know, what was at home was your own responsibility and IT had no input into that. Well, with people working hybrid now, and most people actually saying they're going to work at least one day a week or more remotely, we're seeing where firms are actually loosening that up and saying, you know what, to properly protect the firm, our IT persons can either out go out physically or virtually and make sure that remote setup is secure to the firm standard and it's properly implemented. And so for large firms, they have the IT people um, on staff, but a smaller firm actually should probably hire an IT provider, uh, you know, someone who does network design and all that is security specialized um, to go out there and actually do it to confirm it is secure. But this is something you can outsource. You don't need to hire somebody full time to do this. It depends on the firm size there. You know, w w when you see more and more firms putting clouds in the or applications in the cloud and running up there, we see a reduction in the IT people needs inside of the firm. And so um, 
the managed security component is actually being increasingly outsourced um, to people like Eric or to cloud providers. You know, like Right Networks, we have a managed secure workstation kind of feature that we provide to our clients as well. So another change that both you and David were speaking about the other day was the BYOD policy. The bring your, it was all the rage. You could bring whatever computer you want. We'll help you. And now you guys are kind of saying, I'm going to pull back from that. Absolutely. It's, what happens with BYOD, you don't know what antivirus software is there. You don't know who else has been on the machine. You don't know what they've downloaded on there that could be compromised in the network. So we actually recommend you only allow connectivity through firm authorized and managed machines. And like for instance, at Right Networks, my device here, all the updates, all the maintenance security, they're run on the background. I cannot, I can't plug in any kind of storage to drive. Or like you mentioned, you know, a, a USB flash drive is one of the easiest ways to physically compromise a network. In our drives, it's all disabled. And that's what you should do is, is make sure you minimize the risk to the firm all the way down to the workstation. And don't even let those remote, um, you know, tablets connect and all that unless it's been installed no by your people. <laughs> Security gonna, was never fond of it. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break to hear another word from our sponsor, Right Networks, and when we come back, we'll have your third CPE code for you. So we'll see you in just a moment. Welcome back. Please make note of the CPE code, which is appearing on the bottom of your screen. This is the third code that you need in order to collect continuing education credit for this session. And while you're writing that down, um, I want to mention that uh, data security, and this goes back to the title of this session, which is data security, it's the law. Um, data security is more than just a good idea. It actually is the law, right? And, yeah, and yeah. what is that law? How does that work? Well, you know, when Graham Bleach Lally came out and restructured basically all the financial laws, it also authorized the IRS to basically make sure you protect taxpayer da data that's out there. And you can't knowingly release any data. So basically, if you um, have an issue where you have data that is connecting through the Internet, you're required to go through um, multi-factor authentication. Um, you're required to be aware of the IRS um, Security 6, which is the standard you know, antivirus, malware software, VPN use, backup software. Um, but you also have, you're required to do phishing training, security training, and then you need to have a written information security plan. So as I mentioned, when you renewed your P10 renewal, the W12, question number 11 says you would agree that you have a written information security plan in there. And so do firms have the capability to create that written plan? What we see is the medium and larger size firms, there's a lot of templates out there that they can copy to do that. But smaller firms, you know, most of them, when I go in and do a review, they don't have those tools. And so um, in that case, they should work with their security <laughs> professional out there to make sure it meets all the IRS criteria. And it's, it's a little bit of gray area because it says it's appropriate to your circumstances. Yeah. And so um, a lot of times by going to a cloud provider, it handles a lot of those that information. And, and I will state that there are six requirements is the minimum bar. Mm. You probably should be doing even more than that. And then if your firm deals with anybody or any information that's covered via HIPAA, HIPAA states that if you get hit with ransomware, that is considered a breach, just like if somebody would have walked in, picked up your server, and walked out the door with it because you lost control of that data. So it's your fault. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then there's security standards with regards to even accepting credit cards. So PCI, yeah. payment card industry data security standards, PCI DSS. And that actually tends to be a little bit higher water bar yeah. uh, that, that we've learned. And so you talk about, and they do have a lot of tools. So this stuff is readily available. You can see, you know, kind of what's required, you know, in connection with that standard. And so some good checklists, some, some, some good, you know, resources to work from directly available. Uh, I think for a lot of our 
organizations, we've just said, whatever you do, don't store credit cards, you yeah. know, in any internal systems, because that is just kind of game over from a PCI DSS perspective. But it is a good standard. So a lot of times we'll go through that, you know, SOC 2, PCI DSS, you know, we'll, we'll start just, you know, that's part of our, going back to the vendor onboarding and the vendor management conversation we had earlier, that's some of the criteria that we're gonna want to evaluate. You know, do they have and are those, you know, uh, those, those are, are those credentials up to date? That's part of our annual renewal cycle with our vendors. And again, depending upon what state you're located in, you mm -hmm. have uh, state regulations, so California, Massachusetts, uh, you know, and unfortunately, we have 50 states, we have 50 <laughs> different standards. <laughs> I was going with 100. <laughs> so for the say the smaller practitioner, where do they start? What, what are like best practices for either assessing your situation or trying to protect or, you know, what, what should, what are, what's the advice for the smaller practi practitioner? Well, I know one thing the AICPA does through their PCPS is they have a security checklist of the most common things you should do. And what we're saying is, is not that you have to know those answers, but sit down with your IT professional and go through the status of each one of those items. And it includes everything from updates um, of software to where you store your data to the, admit, you know, the levels yeah. of, of access you provide for the different products. But sit down and understand where, do you, where are you compared to what the rules are and what is the remediation that needs to be done in place. And that checklist can be downloaded you know, either from the ISCPA, Right Networks, we have that on our website as well. It's mm -hmm. a security checklist. But then it gives you a good overview of the main things you need to know. Yeah, and if you want to take it even higher, uh, you can go out to the computer infrastructure or CISA.gov and there's a plethora of NIST handbooks and checklists and things that are available. So uh, how is that spelled? CISA. Uh, uh, gov. gov okay. and then it's the NIST 800 series. Okay. Uh, National, but, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Yeah. Okay, thanks. But that's probably about five or six hundred pages of <laughs> controls. Good, yeah. good bedtime reading. Yeah. Okay, any other tips for, you know, what people need to make sure of or be aware of or last minute horror stories? I think we've touched on a lot of the, you know, kind of what we see to be, you know, the most prevalent today. And I think that's always understanding that security is a moving target. Mm -hmm. And so no sooner do we shore up one thing, then we might learn that we're under attack, you know, elsewhere. So it's just, a, it's a game of, of escalation. It's, it's not something, you know, we always say security is not an event. It's a process and it's an ongoing process and it's literally 24-7, 365 because we're under attack 24-7, 365. We want to make certain that we don't think about it just annually or semi-annually, that every day we live with security awareness uh, and so understand what the current risks are and make certain that you are proactive about saying, how am I doing? You know, how am I engaging? Do we, you know, are we particularly vulnerable with regards to that risk point? Okay, and one other thing, when we have, uh, when we're dealing with remote workers, besides perhaps trying to supply them with company-owned equipment, mm -hmm. are any, are you seeing any firms setting up guidelines for what those remote workers should be doing and holding them accountable if they're not doing that? Yes, uh, we've seen where once they pushed them out, or working from home. No, you're not allowed to use your home Wi-Fi. They, uh, and again, it, it goes back to risk management. But so partner management level, they're dropping in an entirely separate, segregated internet connection that they have to connect to. That goes back to the discussion that firms are now taking responsibility for the remote site, just like it was a satellite office. Yeah. Okay. Taking responsibility for the perimeter because you've yeah. extended it. Excellent. Outstanding. Thank you all so much. What a great session. And thank you all for being with us for this session. Don't go away because as soon as we come back, we're going to be talking about client collaboration and what the best practices are for dealing with your clients, especially in more of a remote world. So we'll be back at the top of the hour. Hi, I'm Erica with CPA Charge, the online payment solution designed specifically for the accounting industry. CPA Charge is proud to help CPAs and accounting professionals expand their payment options and boost their cash flow. With CPA Charge, you can easily and securely accept credit, debit, and check ACH payments from your clients online. Plus, creating an account is easy with zero setup or cancellation fees 
and no long-term contracts required. Swing by to check out a demo and see why over 150,000 professionals trust our payment technology.